Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk things at you and you presumably listen to many of the things that I say for about whatever percentage it is that YouTube tells me that the average viewer watches my segments. So anyway, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about math and faith in statistics because this is something that I think is really kind of interesting is, is you see a lot of emerging sort of, uh, they're not really, they're, they're like pseudo-religions based around statistics and other kind of uh, sci scientific ideas and uh, like especially like you get things that people will get very riled up about stuff like i remember the, the global warming debate was one of the big ones and i'm not saying i'm not taking a side on the global warming thing but let me just say that that whole debate involved a lot of statistics and a lot of people supporting the statistics and not necessarily knowing what the statistics actually meant or how they were found or where there might be flaws and so it wasn't really that these people had like hard science that they were like agreeing with. It wasn't as though scientists had said, you know, this is it, we've discovered the answer. It was simply that they had some statistics and people had such faith in these statistics that they refused to question them. And then they formed kind of a strange, almost sort of a strange, almost like religious following around it. They just refused to drop this belief in global warming. And if you questioned it, you got, you got ridiculed. And, uh, and the reason I feel like this is something that I, I talked about feminism uh, a while back, back in one of my videos, I think like episode, was it 10? Probably episode 10 of the Let's Play of Pony Fantasy, which I can't believe it was been that long ago. It must have been a good couple months, I suppose. But anyway, though, I, I talked about feminism and kind of how I didn't like the ridicule and, and stuff like that that's involved. It's because it's all sort of, that's all sort of group control. That's to keep people from questioning too much stuff and to keep them unified against opponents and this and that and this and that. And I got a lot of comments and a lot of emails from people who were very concerned because it was kind of their opinion that they, they believed in what you call uh, Pascal's Wager. And Pascal's Wager, is a, it's a philosophical thing. This guy named Pascal, he proposed that there are two options in life. He says you could believe in God or you could choose not to believe in God. And he says if you believe in God, there's a chance that maybe you can go to heaven and that would be a good deal. But if you don't believe in God, then nothing good happens at all. And so you're better putting your money on your belief in God because there's more, there's more chances for a positive outcome through your faith. And so I got these people who were sending me a lot of emails and it was kind of in that same vein. It was like a Pascal's Wager but with feminism. Is they were saying like maybe you know there are there's some bad feminists out there and there are some feminists who are doing things that we shouldn't do but they said uh feminism on the whole strives to be positive because it's it's better to believe in feminism than to not believe in the feminism it was the same thing and again it comes down to very much the same notion as pascal's wager is based on a poor understanding of probability and statistics and and again a lot of feminists beliefs and rhetoric are based kind of around statistics and and uh, and things like that so i thought it would be interesting to talk about that sort of thing because it doesn't it doesn't just limit it's not limited to just feminism or just to global warming it crops up all the time and i'm sure that there's going to be another hot button issue in the future that's going to crop up it's going to be the exact same thing and just because something relies on statistics doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong or inaccurate, but I just think it would be good for those who are interested to learn a little bit about how statistics work and why they, they really must be questioned frequently. And questioning them is a good thing, it's a great thing for the thing that you support and everything else. So, uh, where to start? We actually... I don't want to get really deep into probability because it's probably the most complex and abstract math that I have ever been involved with. I mean, I've done like advanced calculus, Taylor series, stuff like that. Probability takes almost everything that I've learned and then just applies it in, this, in these bizarre ways that you wouldn't expect. Uh, just to give you an example, one famous case, there's uh, I'll, I'll alter the case a little bit because normally it's a little it involves kind of like numbers and there's a car behind some doors and stuff like that uh, Suppose that you are you are a young lady and because we were discussing feminists Suppose you are a young lady and you know three guys like you get a job at a bar And you, you meet these three guys and they work at the bar and you've heard from your friends that two of these three guys are just uh, they're cheaters like they're smiling tigers You know they'll screw around behind your back as soon as you start dating them, but you won't know until it's too late so they're all kind of handsome and they're all kind of nice on the surface and you're, you're sort of interested in all three of them and, and all three of them have given you their number and you can call any of these three guys. Now, 
The problem is, like I say, you don't know which one is a problem guy. So you just choose one of these guys and you write up a text. And But then before you send the text, your friend calls you on the phone and she goes, oh, did you just hear one of the guys that you didn't, the guy, one of the guys, one of the guys got arrested. He was a guy who you hadn't chosen. Like you'd started to send this text to one of the other two guys and the third guy just got arrested. So you know that he's no good. He got arrested for like hitting a, hitting an ex-girlfriend or something like that. You know that he's no good. He's out. Now you've got two guys to choose from. Now, what are the odds that you are going to choose? How do you maximize the odds that you choose the right guy? Now, surprisingly, this is an incredibly complex question because you think there's two options. One of them is good. One guy is, one guy is good. One guy is bad. You think that you would be, it wouldn't make a difference. Like you could switch. Like you're chosen, you've chosen one guy. You're going to text one guy. You think that you could switch over to the other guy and you'd have the same probability of getting the wrong guy. But actually, it depends on the model that you construct. See, because everything in science works around models. Nothing is ever a perfect solution and answer. Everything is always, it's always a model. And so, anyways, I don't know if you guys can hear that. That's Alan's alarm clock. He will turn that off repeatedly for the next couple hours. Uh, but anyway, the, so yes, uh, so models, right? It's a model. It depends on when you make your model and how you do it. Now, the simplest model is, it, it is correct to say that if you already have these two choices, you have no way of knowing which one is correct. So it doesn't really make a difference if you switch between one or the other. However, if you go back and you look at the problem in a broader sense, you can construct a model where you can actually alter the probability and have a higher chance of choosing the correct guy. Now, uh, this is a little bit baffling, so I'll try to, I'll try to be as simple as I can about it. But the fact is, is that you had three guys, three guys, two of them were awful. You were more likely, on your first guess, to choose an awful guy. So that means that when you have one of the awful guys eliminated, the odds are still pretty good that you had chosen the lousier prospect. So knowing that the, that the third guy has been eliminated, if you switch your odds, you actually increase the odds that you might wind up with the good guy, if that makes any sense. Uh, some of you guys might be scratching your head and trying to wrap your, like, really wrap your brains around this. This is one of these that statistics, uh, stat, uh, uh, probability experts, statisticians, statisticians, they've been arguing about this for the longest time. Because as I say, there are two solutions to this one probability problem, to this one problem of like statistics and understanding how these things are approached. Uh, it's because one of them takes into account conditional parameters and the other one uh, assumes no conditional parameters. A conditional parameter would be like a thing that like there's like you have a pre-existing condition that occurs before you make your model or during your model or whatever. And so this is something that comes up a lot in studies that involve statistics is, is they make these assumptions and they don't always assume every single conditional parameter correctly because usually they don't know what every single conditional, conditional parameter is. And so st st statistics are extremely prone to error. You never really know if the study is good or if it's bad. Did they ask the right questions? Did they say the right things? Did they record data? Did they influence the testing in the right way? Uh, many, many things go into, go into statistics that you would not really think about and that often get overlooked. And for this reason, statistics, statistics, I cannot say this word, statistics and like corollary data and things like that are considered the second weakest form of empirical data for anyone to rely on. The most unreliable would be anecdotes. Like they call it case studies. It was the kind of thing that Freud based his entire body of research on. Almost everything that Freud did was an anecdote and oftentimes he was he was just completely outright lying like Freud was was a bit of a fraudster so statistics they're not very strong in terms of data they mean virtually nothing when you see a statistical study and it tells you like they say oh it probably means this they are full of crap the statistics mean nothing like they give you what they give you is the ability to form a hypothesis see because you say we've got this data and I think that maybe this data is being caused by this. And we'll have to go and we'll have to do some empirical studies and figure out a way that we can isolate these variables and test them very specifically so we know how much they're actually contributing to stuff. And then that gets into its own really touchy sort of situation where, 
where oftentimes in social behavior, people don't really form very good tests. Like for example, there's one really noteworthy case where they had, uh, uh, they, did, they, they thought that if you stimulated one of the nerves, one of the major nerves in the body <clears throat> that run down from your spine, of course, I think it was like the vagus nerve or something like that, they thought that if you stimulated it, that it would help relieve depression. And so they set up this study and they brought in a bunch of people and they had like half of them got the surgery and the other half they did nothing to, right? And then they found out that the people who got the surgery, they reported feeling better, their depression was alleviated. And so they said, oh, you know, there we go. The vagus nerve is, is more likely to be, is, it's, it's likely to be involved in depression somehow, just like we thought. There was a hypothesis, you know, we had some statistical data, we, we had some, we had some number data, and then we had a study, and the study supported our number data. And they were pretty happy about this. They were sort of looking forward. But then another researcher looked into it, and he says, uh, you didn't have a control group. And they said, no, yes, we did. The group that we did nothing to was our control group. And they said, no. That was a test group, that was an experimental group, because you didn't do anything to them. See, you did something to the group that got invasive surgery. The group that got invasive surgery was really hoping that they would get better, and they really wanted to get better after all the surgery, because it's a tough road to recovery, and everything else. And so they believed they were going to get better. The people who came to the waiting room and sat around for like a half hour got no assistance, those people didn't think that they were going to get better at all. And so when you asked them how they were doing, they were moping around feeling like no one had assisted them, and they felt worse. So they redid the test, and this time they used saline injections, saline just being salt water. They just injected salt water into these people, and sure enough, the people who got salt water injections did just as well as the people who got this invasive surgery. And it went to show that the surgery was not at all worth it. It was pointlessly dangerous, it didn't assist with anything, you could have just given them sugar pills. I mean, sugar, sugar pills are not really a placebo. That's one thing uh, many people make a mistake about. Sugar is something that actually has an effect in your body, and people react to sugar differently. So they try not to do sugar pills. They like saline injections and stuff like that, or saline t tablets and stuff like that. Things, things that won't cause your body to have any noticeable differences. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So even empirical data can be a little bit funny if you don't know what to look for, which you don't know what to look for. So, statistics. Fun stuff, rather complicated, but as I say, everything in science is a model, and the models don't always describe. You have to think like gravity is a model, and they say gravity is a theory, and then people kind of get like, they get like a little haughty about that. They're like, oh, you know, gravity is a theory, and they get into these, they use that as a debate. And the fact is that gravity is a theory. It's a model. It's a model that doesn't work when you get down to the molecular level. See, and they're trying to figure out a better model that will work when you get down to the molecular model, but they don't know a good model yet. They can't figure one out because they don't know what's going on with this stuff. So, uh, you know, gravity is a very good model when you use it on the right things. Same thing goes often with statistics and probability and so forth. It's, it's a good model when you know specifically what you're looking at. But if there's any question to the data, oftentimes the model itself is probably flawed and highly questionable. It doesn't matter if you have like a large spread of the data or if you can say like, oh, uh, one thing that I've seen is they're like 90% of men are likely to commit some kind of crime against their wives at some point. That's one that someone has linked me to. Like I said, I've got feminist friends that drive me completely up the wall with this kind of stuff. And they say, uh, they say 90% of men are, are likely to commit a crime against their wives. And when you really look into it, like you find out like what did they qualify as a violent crime and it would be something like, uh, or as a, just not even a violent crime, it will be something non-specific. And you find out it'll be like, if you're sweet on your wife while she's drunk, that would be a crime. It is a crime, highly underreported crime, because most, most women don't feel like, uh, you know, uh, hooking up with their husbands after they've had a bit to drink is too strange. So uh, that kind of thing is leading, it's very leading data. There's, there's bad statistics, there's bad models, and then there's just bad researchers who just want you to believe their whole thing. Because you have to think that people will buy their books and people will fund their studies if they sort of fudge the data and lead it to say something that it really shouldn't say. So that, all of this really more, um, my, my real beef with feminism and global warming and everything else, like, I don't, I don't really like believe in feminism. I don't really believe that all the, the cultural things are really true. And one of the one of the reasons I don't really take much stock in it is just because it's 
it's one of those things where as soon as you start to question it, as soon as you talk to like a, a really just a ardent feminist about the whole thing and you say like, you know, this data could have some flaws, the first thing that happens is ridicule. It was the same thing that happened with global warming. You know, you'd say like, I, this data could be flawed and then you get ridiculed. They're like, you know, you're not, when you die, not pro-science, you know? And it was one of those things that was like, no, I'm fairly pro-science. I just, I just feel like we could do a slightly better science on these, on these subjects. So, uh, yeah, you can, you can enjoy statistics. You can read them and say like, oh yes, this is valuable, but just be aware that they are, uh, bas it's basically trash data. I mean, like no one in the scientific community looks at statistics and says like, aha, Eureka, I've discovered the truth. It doesn't work that way. So, yes, uh, faith and functions. That is the topic of the day. So I hope that was enlightening and not too convoluted. I stuttered a little bit trying to say the word statistics frequently. Something about that S-T-T-T-T -T -T did not turn out so well. But uh, knowledge passed on. So I will talk to you guys later.